10, verse 1. And all the commandments which I command you this day shall be observed to do, that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know that what is in thine heart, whether thou would keep the commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For well, the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a good land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, and land of wheat, and of barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, and the land of oil and honey. The land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou shalt made dig brass. When thou hast eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good given thee. And that's our text verse, verse 10. I'll read that one more time. And when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. And let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful to be living in America today in a place where we can stand and open the Word of God and read it. Lord, I'm so thankful to be in a country that even has the Bible. And Lord, you have blessed this country. And Lord, I'm so thankful, dear God, that you've allowed us to be a part of this church. And Lord, I pray that, dear God, you would bless now the reading of your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak to hearts today. And Father, if there's one person here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this would be the day they'd get born again. Now, Father, help us all to pay attention now as the man of God preaches. And Father, please now, I pray for truth out of your word today, dear God, that will help us. Dear God, thank you now. Bless the reading of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, they shouted in heaven when you got saved. Thank God. I want to talk to you this morning about the subject, let it go. Let it go. And I want you to listen carefully. I'm going to give you a little background, and then I'm going to give you a couple of points, and then we're going to eat some fried chicken. Uh, let it go. Brother Bowen's back in town, so we're going to his house for fried chicken today. <laughs> And so I hope you'll listen uh, carefully this morning. Father, thank you for church. Thank you for a place we can come and gather around the Word of God and the families back together in fellowship and uh, for a taste of heaven. This is what it would be when we get to heaven, a lot of fellowship, a lot of wonderful times of enjoyment. And uh, so, Father, we ask you, please, Father, just take this time today. And, and if folks don't listen, they'll not get fed. If they don't get fed, they'll not have strength to face tomorrow. So, Holy Spirit of God, that which is known to you and unknown to us, you're going to talk to us this morning and prepare us for that which you know is going to occur in our lives. And so, may we listen, sit up straight, pay attention. Holy Spirit, talk to us now, please. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Look this way and listen carefully. The Israelite nation is, was in Egypt. They had gone uh, there because Joseph was there and Later on, his father and his brothers came, as you remember. And they had grown now to be a great people, multitudes of people. And these uh, Israelites began to take over the land of Egypt. And the Egyptians became concerned because of the great growth of the Israelites. And they feared the Israelites were, were becoming too powerful. And so the Egyptians made the Israelites slaves and in order to control them. Um, the suffering of the Israelites during that time is, is just really uh, undes uh, 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 just indescribable. Uh, it, it's always been that way. It began with that burning bush, and God's people have been in the fire ever since, but they'll never be consumed. Don't you worry about it. If you're God's child, don't you worry about it. Don't you fret for a second. You're God's child, and you'll not be consumed. Don't you worry about it. The Israelites in bondage became weary and began to cry out to God. And uh, they worked in the brick factories, you remember, of Egypt. And finally, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. 
You're not going to sleep while I preach this morning. Now, you're not going to do it. Now, st stand up. 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 Everybody standing? All right. Good. All right. So raise your hands up like this. All right. Lean to the left. All right. Lean to the right. Say hallelujah. Okay. Sit down. Keep it up. Stay awake now. Don't you fall asleep while I'm preaching. Some of you, you might as well bring a pillow and a blanket and lay down. Oh, shut up. You're not going to do it, so just quit it. Finally, through the uh, miracle of the Passover, the Israelites were delivered from the land of Egypt, you recall. Pharaoh told them to go ahead and leave, and they did. They came to the Red Sea, and, and uh, Pharaoh had changed his mind one time too often. You better watch the next time you change your mind about God and about God's people. You may, it may be your last time to change it. And the armies of Egypt pursued these Israelites, you remember. And now the Israelites faced the Red Sea. In front of them is the sea with mountains to the left, mountains to the right. And the armies of Egypt are behind them, pursuing them, breathing down their neck. Now, it looks pretty bad for the children of Israel. And, but God said to them, I want you to say this with me. Go forward. Say it. Go forward. Say it again. Go forward. Here's what God said to them. Okay, you got the Red Sea in front of you, mountains to the left, mountains to the right, the armies behind you. The only solution you've got is to go forward. And that's always the best advice that you could receive. Only thing you can do, go forward. So Moses smote the Red Sea, and the waters were parted, you remember, and God caused the wind to blow the, the muddy ground uh, to become dry, and, and the bottoms became dry. So the Israelites went over on dry ground. And the Egyptians kept on pursuing, and God allowed the water to come back and drown the Egyptians. And they got on the other side, and they needed water to drink. And God told Moses to smite a rock in Horeb with his rod. And God said he would cause water to gush out enough to, to take, take care of three and a half to four million Jews. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, and then they needed something to eat. And God said, uh, uh, okay, uh, let I'll send manna every morning from heaven. He did that for 40 years, by the way. And God sent manna every morning, and that covered the earth like a early dawn, uh, 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 the early dew of the morning dawn. And uh, then they needed to know which way to go. So God sent them a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them. And then they faced another problem. They had no Walmart, no Kmart, no J.C. Penney, no malls. And the women were complaining. And uh, no place to get clothes and shoes. And so what did God do? God let their clothes grow and God let their shoes grow. Oh, that God would do that again. And uh, so then they, they wanted, uh, they, they uh, began to want uh, flesh, and so God sent them quail uh, every day for 40 days. So they come to the Jordan River. Now, don't leave me now. They come to the Jordan River after 40 years of traveling in the wilderness, and the Jordan is, uh, is parted, and they cross over into Canaan land. Now, let's go back and look at all these. Now, I gave you all the blessings, didn't I? Did I not give you all the blessings? There's all the blessings. There's what God did for his people. Now let's go back and start over again and listen carefully. The Israelites, by the way, we're going to use our Bibles. I hate to do that to you fundamentalists, but we're going to use our Bibles. Now, the Israelites were in bondage and they complained. Wait a minute. All these blessings that we read, and yet they complained. They were in heavy slavery. God said, tell the people of every household, choose a lamb. Had to be a male lamb. Had to be without blemish on the 14th day of the first month. That lamb was to be a, a sacrificial lamb. And they, well, they, they, he said, I want the blood from that lamb taken to the front door of that house. And I want the blood sprinkled on the lintel of the front door of that house. And during the night, I'm going to send a death angel over each of these houses. And every house that has the blood applied, the death angel will pass over. But every house where the blood is not applied, the firstborn will die. That night the death angel came. That night the firstborn of every house without the blood applied was taken. And Pharaoh then says, okay, Moses, take the people and go. Wow, now the people are free. No longer do they have to make bricks like slaves and work in a brick factory. They're free. They're no longer slaves. And God has led them, and now they are free. Now take your Bibles and turn to Exodus 14, 12. Exodus 14, 12. Now we're going to use our Bibles, and so I want you to Follow along Exodus 14, 12. In Exodus chapter 14 and verse 12, look what happens. Now here they're free. God has led them and they're free. The blessing of freedom from slavery. Exodus 14, 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than what we should die in the wilderness. Wait a minute. They were complaining because they were slaves. 
God blessed them and set them free, and the first thing they did was start complaining. Uh, hold it, you'd think they'd have been shouting. You'd think they'd had a revival meeting, but they were griping. Now listen to me, you are never satisfied when you get what you want. When your appetite is satisfied, you'll never be satisfied. So they said, here we are, uh, ahead of us is the Red Sea, behind us the Egyptian army. Moses, we told you that this wouldn't work, and Moses would have been better if we'd just stayed in Egypt and eaten cucumbers, watermelon, leeks, and garlic. Wait a minute. Brother Bowen, garlic? Wait a minute. Onions? Hold it. They had created an appetite in Egypt. That was not what they were used to eating, but because they'd been in Egypt so long, they picked up the appetite of Egypt. So now they wanted to have that appetite fed again. Forgive me, but I'd rather have pecan pie and, and pumpkin pie with a lot of whipped cream on it and a little ice cream on the side just in case. Now, let me give you a couple of thoughts here. Egypt always looks better looking back to it than being back in it. Let me say it again. Egypt always looks better looking back to it than being back in it. So here you are, a Christian, born again, your God's child, name's written down in heaven, and you're sitting here, and, you, and you're and you looking back, and you, you think it looks better back there, but when you were back there, you were mad about it, mad about everything. You thought it was horrible, you thought it was terrible, but now you're a little bit upset with God because you're living off of the negatives of life, and because you are, you're upset with God, and you forgot about all the blessings. I just read blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing that God had done, but now after the very first blessing, Brother Queen, what happened? And they began to complain and began to gripe. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are saved on your way to heaven? Oh my goodness, what in the world? Young lady, sit up. Young lady, sit, sit that young lady up. Sit up, young lady. You're in church now. Act like you're a human being and sit up straight. Pay attention. Now, I'm saying this morning that you and I are living in the United States of America. We have freedom. I mean, look, look at the lifestyle. The worst that we have it in America is better than, 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 than what the best the world has to offer us. We are, put a smile on your face. If you got one, show me your teeth. You got any teeth? I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm God's child. I'm glad I'm going to heaven and I'm not going to bring this baggage of negatives with me. And so they complained to Moses, and Moses goes to God, and God told Moses, go forward, and Moses tells the people to go forward. Now, look, number two, God doesn't perform miracles for folks going backwards. God doesn't perform miracles for folks going backwards. You who are starting to go back to the world, don't you expect God to perform a miracle for you? God's going to put his stamp of approval on those going forward. Now, what you better do is you better realize you cannot, my friend, young people, young people, hey, young lady, scoot down, scoot down there next to Miss Bonnie, scoot all the way down, all the way down, separate yourself unless y'all are dating each other, scoot on down, uh, scoot down, young lady, scoot down, thank you very much, and so God said, I will bless you, I will perform miracles as long as you're going forward. Now, I would suggest to you that you quit complaining and start going forward. I would suggest you forget about all the bad that happened back there and forget it because it's happened to all of us. It's happened to all of us. Everybody. It's happened to everybody. Well, don't carry it with you. You go forward for God. I said Egypt always looks better looking back to it than being back. Go ahead, fella. Uh, go ahead. You go right ahead. You used to sit down here, and now you sit in the back section. Then you sit in the back row, and then you sit in the balcony. Then you're looking. You know what you're looking for? The exit. You're looking for the exit. What are you doing? Trying to get back to the world. If there were a third tier built here, you'd sit in that. You won't go to a ball game do that. Let's suppose a miracle did play, take place and the Cowboys were at the Super Bowl. Let's suppose there was a miracle. After watching that turkey roast last Thursday, I don't think that'll happen. But, uh, but let's suppose, it, and let's suppose it was a Friday night where Christians could go. And let's suppose the cheerleaders had dresses all the way down to their ankles. And let's suppose that the only beer was sold was root beer. And so we could go to that game, and so we went to that game, and you were the first in line to get a ticket. You wouldn't say, get me a ticket as far away from the playing field as I can get. No, they fight for the 50-yard 50 uh, 50 line. They fight for those seats. Boy, when you come to church, don't you get away from God. Ain't nothing but trouble when you get away from God. I'm waiting for somebody to say amen to me. You get out there in that world, you'll end up being a drunk, a dope head, end up wrecking your life and ruining your life. Please, I tell you, the devil's a liar. No, you don't need a new wife. You need to love the one God gave you. 
You don't need a new husband. You don't love the one God gave you. Somebody say amen. So God doesn't perform miracles with those going backwards. Now they are free, but still complaining. Uh, number Statement number three. They carried the negatives with them. They carried the negatives of life with them. That's why they were complaining. Because they thought about Egypt, they carried that with them. They carried the negatives of life. Okay, go to Exodus chapter 16 with me, please. Exodus chapter 16. And let's take a look at Exodus chapter 16 and verse 3. Exodus cha and verses 2 and 3. Exodus 16, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. You know, I've often wondered, why didn't they shake their fist at God? They're going to do that. They're going to shake their fist at God's man. Murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat at the flesh pots. And we would eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth in this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We're going to die of hunger. Wait a minute. You were slaves and complained about that. There was a... I remember a couple up north led, led the lady to Christ. She got excited. She came to church, and she, I can still see her. She, she, she hit the altar. Get my husband saved. Get my husband. He beats us. He drinks. Get my husband saved. Get my husband saved. Husband's name was Carl. We'd go by week after week. My wife and I'd go by and try to win Carl to Christ. He'd slam the door. He'd get upset. She'd come back, weep, and go, oh, go see my husband. Go see my husband. We'd go back and see Carl again. And then next thing you know, he'd, she'd be that, that down at the altar. And I wish she wouldn't sleep. If you're going to sleep, go to the back row and lay down and take a nap. No, don't do that. Uh, and so finally one day Carl was there on a Saturday afternoon. He was bawling and squalling. And Carl, boy, he said, my marriage falling apart. My wife and I led him to Christ. He got saved. Came to church the next Sunday, walked the aisle, got baptized, got on fire. She never came back on Sunday night, but all of a sudden he dragging her back on Sunday night. She didn't come on Wednesday night, but he started dragging her back on Wednesday night. And then we mentioned soul winning. Boy, he said, all right, I'm going soul winning. So, brother, boy, he got on fire, started going soul winning. Next thing I know, she's in my office saying, I've lost my husband. <laughs> I meant for him to get saved, but I didn't mean for him to be a fanatic. Listen, you're either hot for God or cold for God. you got to be one way or the other. Somebody say amen now. I'm saying to you, what happens? The goodness of God came to their life, but she began to complain. See, she liked the martini. She liked the dancing. She just didn't like the beating. So if man got saved, he not only got rid of beating her, he got rid of the martinis. And she didn't like that. She liked the dance of this rag twist and the skunk skedaddle. She liked that stuff. You could have gone to a charismatic church and done that too, but but somewhere you need to understand about this matter. Look, ladies and gentlemen, they complain and they gripe. They're out of Egypt, but now they begin to complain. And now what are they doing? They're carrying all the negatives with them. Oh my! They'd been delivered by the Passover lamb. They'd walked over on, the, on, on dry ground, and, the, uh, and when the Red Sea was parted, they ought to be praising God. Hey, we ought to be shouting this morning. If you're saved, you've been saved by the lamb. You've been delivered. You have your name written down in heaven. You're no longer a slave, old smutty face. You're God's child. You're on your way to heaven. Oh, somebody give me a testimony. So, but they complain. Now, if anybody in the world ought to be happy, it ought to be God's redeemed people. If your sins are forgiven and you're God's child this morning, your name's written down in heaven and you're not going to go to hell when you die. But they said, we're hungry. We'd rather be back in Egypt, rather die in Egypt, be out here. Well, so God, uh, God heard their complaining and he sent them some food. And the God who uh, heard their complaint and dried the Red Sea, heard their complaint and destroyed the armies of the uh, Egyptian army. And God heard their complaint again. And God sent them morning for every morning for 40 years, manna, uh, uh, sweet bread from heaven. And you'd think they'd be happy, saved from Egypt. Red Sea parted, walked through on dry ground. Egyptian armies were all drowned. If anybody in the world had seen the hand of God, they had seen the hand of God. If any church in the world has seen the hand of God, this church has seen the hand of God and ought not be complaining, ought not be, well, everybody hates us. I don't give a flip as long as God loves us. So we don't have respect to anybody. As long as I got respect to God, that's all I need. Well, I tell you what, can't wait to get out of here. Not me, buddy. I'm enjoying it. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I don't want to go back to the old world. I don't want to go back to a dead church. I don't want to go back. I'm, not, I'm going to stay right where I'm at. And by the way, I'm going to be loyal to this church, too. 
I'm going to get off somewhere and badmouth this church or badmouth the preacher because that's me. I'm not going to badmouth me. You see, you understand that. Now, uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 3. Exodus 17, verse 3. In Exodus 17, verse 3, he said this, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us, and our children and our cattle with thirst? So what are they doing? They're not rejoicing because of being out of Egypt. They're not rejoicing because of the part of the Red Sea. They're not rejoicing because of the dry ground. They're not rejoicing because Egyptian armies have been drowned. They're not rejoicing because every morning man has been fed to them. Now they're griping because they're thirsty. But they ought to be rejoicing. Uh, why can't we say, glory to God, we've crossed the Red Sea? Why can't we say, glory to God, we're out of Egypt? Why can't we say, glory to God, the Egyptian armies have been drowned? So what do they do? They cry. So God now takes Moses to take his rod and goes to Horeb and smites that rock for water. And I love it because that rock followed him everywhere they went. Supplied water. You say, that can't be. If God can part the Red Sea, he could bring water to them too, you know. Now, I'm just saying that, hold it, the water from Horeb, for three and a half, four million Jews, they've, they've never thirsted again. They've been delivered from Egypt. They've been saved from the bondage of slavery. They've, they've seen the waters of the Red Sea parted. They've seen a big wind come and dry up that mucky water. And they went across on dry ground. And now three and a half, four million Jews, Israelites, will walk across on dry ground. Armies of Pharaoh drowned in the water behind them. They're delivered from Egypt, from the Egyptian, from Pharaoh, from uh, uh, manna from heaven now. And now they're getting water from the rock. They should have had revival, but they didn't. Turn to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11 and verses 4 and 5. I'm moving too quickly. Just jot the references down. Numbers chapter 11 and verses 4 and 5. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell on lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish when we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the, and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlics. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this man before our eyes. Wait a minute here. Delivered from Egypt, the Egyptians and Pharaoh, manna from heaven, water from the rock. Now they're, they're complaining because that's all they've got. They complain it. Wait a minute. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. So what did God do? God heard their cry. God heard their plea. But do you think that satisfied them? No. No. They griping about no water. And God gave them water. They're griping about their vegetarian diet. We want flesh. So God gave them quail. One day, next day, next day, next day, next day, next day, 30 days, 40 days. Guess what happened? Now they begin to complain. These quail are coming out of our nostrils. Well, I don't know about you, but quail. Have you ever eaten quail? Let me tell you something. It is delicious if it's cooked right. Now, if you get a Yankee that gets quail, doesn't know how to cook it, you just ruin it. They ruin deer and everything else, too. But, uh, but, but I'm just saying, boy, here, here, God told the quail, that, uh, look, I want you for 30 days, I want you to come. And, and that quail, he said to quail, drop dead. The quail dropped dead. There's nobody listening to me. You're all asleep, aren't you? God said drop dead, and they dropped dead. Uh, wow, delivered from Egypt. Thank you, Brother Rios. He finally woke up. Uh, wow, delivered from, through the Red Sea. Delivered from the Egyptian army. Deli given manna from from heaven for 40 years. Given water from the rock of Horeb. And now given quail for 30 days. Now don't miss this. You don't gripe about what you don't have. You gripe and complain because you're a griper. You don't gripe because of what you don't have. You gripe because you're a griper. A complainer. You could be in the best church in the world. I saw them at First Baptist Church of Hammond uh, and Dr. Hiles, and yet they griped. You say, I can't imagine people along you Baptist Temple griping. They're here. They gripe. They complain. But I'm telling you, you are not the church, not the problem. Your husband, not the problem. Your wife is not the problem. The preacher is not the problem. You're a griper. you got Limburger cheese on your mustache, and the whole world stinks. Somewhere in here, you need to understand, you've got, listen, I don't care how bad it's been, you've got to let go. I don't care how rough it is. You turn to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, and let's take a look at uh, uh, 4 and 5. Verse 4. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord in this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Look at verse 5. And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt? Made us. They cried. God deliver us. Nobody made you get saved. You cry. Oh, God, save me. Get me out of this mess. And God heard you. But now you're saying, God made me. 
God didn't make you do nothing. Your wife can't make you do nothing. Your husband can't make you do nothing. Your mama dead sure can't make you do nothing. Look at your bedroom. God made us. What, what a lie. Have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. And here they are complaining, 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 complaining. Now, let me give you a couple of thoughts here. Let it go. Number one, what you think, what you think is mistreatment by God, let it go. What you think is mistreatment by God, you let it go. Look where God put us. You caused it. Your sin nature caused it. Your rebellion caused it. God has to respond one of two ways. He responds to your rebellion or He responds to your fellowship. In both ways, He's got to get you, keep you on track. So if you follow Him, He empowers you to keep on going. You get off the track, God has to do something to get you back on track. That's what happened to the children of Israel. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. I'm saying to you, let go when you think the, 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 think it is mistreatment by God. Number two, let go when you think it's mistreatment by man. Let go of it. Let go of it. Let go of it. Let go of it. Let go of it when you think it's mistreatment by man. Now, let me show you what I mean. This, this is a, uh, I need a couple of fellas here to help me here. Kevin, you hold on to this rope on the other end of that thing, would you? All right, you got it? Okay, I need, uh, over here. Just watch it there. Don't hurt. Don't get on the floor. Get on the floor. You get up there, you'll break your neck. All right. Watch it. Watch it, ladies. Watch it. All right. Come here, son. You grab a hold of this thing. Yeah. You get a hold of that thing. You stand up. 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 All right. Stretch it. Pull on 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 it. Okay. Pull on it. All right. Now watch this. This is what you're doing with God. It's a tug of war. In your mind, you're pulling at God. God, why did you do this? God, you shouldn't have done that. Hey, boys. Hey, church is over. You missed it. We gave out $100 bills. Everybody stayed awake. And you didn't get nothing. Not a thing. I'd suggest you stay awake next time, huh? Okay. All right. Put on this thing. By the way, if you, if you wake up for the rest of the service, that man right there, Brother Bowen up there, is going to give you $100 right up here. Where's Brother Bowen? Okay. And so... So here, this is what you do. This is, this is what you're doing in your mind. By the way, this is what happens when you're mad at somebody. When you're mad at them in your mind, you're having a tug of war. It's you versus that man. It's you versus God. It's you versus that family member. It's you versus the preacher. Well, it's all a mental tug of war. And let me tell you something. You lose when you fight this kind of a game. The best thing to do is when you get in a situation like this, pull on it now, son. Are you pulling? Are you pulling? Straighten your collar up here. Are you pulling? You're not pulling. And uh, are you pulling? Yeah, you're letting. No, you're not pulling. And so you pull on. What happens? Uh, let, let go. Let go. See what happens? Let go. Let go. <sighs> dumb, dumb, dumb. <laughs> so when you let go, he's the only one tugging. There's no war going on. Why are you upset with God? God's blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. Folks, you live in the United States of America. We don't live in Afghanistan. We don't live in, uh, in, in Iraq. We don't live in Africa. We live in the United States of America. You know, I'm a little upset. You, you won't get mad about this. But you're not. You, I, I, I'm German. No, you're not. You're American. Well, I'm Irish. No, you're not. You're American. How many of you are citizens of the United States of America? You're American. Well, I'm Afro-American. You're American. That's what's wrong now. You're talking about racial slurs. That's a racial slur. You're American. We're Americans. We live in the United States of America. We are Americans. We're all in this together. We're Americans. Well, all right now, please understand something right now. Get this settled in your mind. If, if you're God's child, we're going to live together in heaven forever. You get mad at me and I'll be your next door neighbor for all eternity. Oh, let, let, let pick it up. This is what's wrong. This is what's wrong between you and God. You're upset with God. Why? God's blessed and blessed and blessed. But you've got something. You've carried some baggage with you. And now you have this mental tug of war between you and God. And the best thing to do is just let go. Just let go. Let go. You're not going to let go. He lets go. All right? That's what you ought to do. Now, you're dumb when you're over here on this side of it holding on to something that's caused you to be bitter. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. So the children of Israel, thank you, fellas. Give them a hand. Didn't they do a good job? 
So the children of Israel, here they are, blessing after blessing after blessing. And I read it to you at the beginning. Blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. But yet you go back and you find after the first blessing, they complain. After the second blessing, they complain. After the third blessing, they complain. After the fourth blessing, they complain. After the fifth blessing, they complain. And they gripe, it's time that you let it go. Okay, you say, how can I tell if I'm tugging at that rope? What is coming out of your mouth? Get you a tape recorder, put it in your pocket, and play it back at the end of the day. And listen to yourself. If you heard yourself, you'd be upset with yourself. Who is it that you're upset with? Let go. What person are you mad at? Let it go. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Let it go. Let it go. What is it that God, you think God has been unfair to you? Let it go. What you're doing is carrying all the negatives of life, and you're not seeing the positives of life, the blessings that God has given you. Oh, let's start there. If you really want to be thankful for life, be thankful for life. There is no reason for you to care. Now, if you right now got something against somebody, boy, I'm just going to that person. That person, oh, I'll tell you, God, I hope they don't come in. Boy, I see them driving in my driveway. I hope they're not coming in my front door. Wait a minute now. you got a problem, pal. You got a real problem. Well, I'll tell you what. That's why, you know, if we didn't have so many Sunday, adult Sunday school class, some of you people wouldn't, you, you'd leave this church. Because you can leave one Sunday school class, go to another Sunday school class, you're mad at somebody. Upset with somebody. Listen, you better get this thing settled. God has been good to you. God has been good to you. And it's time you got the spirit right in your own heart. Well, the Bob said something good the other day. It's the only time he's ever said anything good. But we were sitting in a staff meeting, and, and he said something that astounded me. And he said, you know, preacher, he said that God gets more upset about the sins of the Spirit than he does the sins of the flesh. Do you know that God killed more people for complaining than adultery? In fact, when the woman in John 8 was caught and brought to him, do you know what, do you know what Jesus did? They said, stone her! She's called adultery! Stone her! And Jesus wrote something in the sand. I think he wrote, where's the man? Because to really be obedient to the law, they had to have the man in order. They couldn't stone the woman without stoning the man. I think Jesus wrote, where's the man? Then he looked up and said, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. Wait a minute. Then he said to the woman, go sin no more. Wow. Yet when you, you who know that you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss, you don't dip, you don't chew, you don't run with those that do, but you got a bad spirit against somebody or something, and it's just eating at you like a cancer. Listen to me, let me tell you, God is more mad at you and upset with you than the adulterer. You know better. You hurt the power of the Holy Ghost of God. You hurt the power of the Holy Ghost in a service convicting people to trust the Savior. You hurt the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because you know better. You know better. You know better. You know better. Well, it's about time you start falling in love with everybody. Well, so you've never been mistreated. Are you kidding me? Walk in my shoes. I'll let you be pastor for a day. You, 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 you'll go postal. You'll start killing people yourself. No, listen, you've got to love everybody if you're going to be a preacher. You have to. You have to. You can't survive. You can't be bitter. Oh, listen, my friend, please, somebody, you who are having problems with family members, let it go. You're having problems with, with your boss at work. Let it go. You're having problems with God. Let it go. You're having problems with your sister or brother. Let it go. You're having problems with your husband. Let the thing go. You're having problems with your wife. Let the thing go. Let it go. Let it go. Don't tug and tug and tug and tug and tug until you're so weary. You can't do anything for God and you focus on one thing and can't look to people who need to be saved and fed and clothed and cared for. You're so wrapped up in that battle of your mind that you've ruined your life. What did they say? Glory to God. Man, parted the Red Sea. Dry ground. Look at the Egyptian army. Bluff, bluff. They're gone. God wiped them out. Hallelujah. What a great God. Then they get in the wilderness and then they start complaining in the wilderness. We, we want to be fed. So God gave them manna, sweet bread, every morning. Baskets of it. Sweet bread. Sweet bread every morning. And then they said, but we were thirsty. So God gave them water. Well, we want flesh. God gave them quail. Anything they wanted, God gave them. But do you see any of that? Thank you for the water. 
Show me a verse. Show me a verse where they said, Praise God for the rock of Horeb. Show me a verse where they said, Praise God for the quail. Show me a verse where they said, Praise God for the Egyptian army that was drowned. Show me a verse. It's not there. Why? Because they weren't going to let go. Look, you're not going to believe this, but there's some people who don't like me. It's hard. I, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's hard for you to believe, but it's true. And I've talked to Brother Landers about it over and over and over again. I was preaching in a certain state, and the pastor picked me up. And so we're going to the hotel, and he said, I cannot believe this, this conference, this Bible conference. I've got my two heroes preaching for me. I said, uh, I, I thought I was the only speaker, and I, because my card said I was the only speaker. And I said, uh, well, who, is there another speaker? And he said, oh, yes, oh, yes. And he called, doctor, and he called his name. Well, this fellow had written headlines against me in his paper. And so I said, oh, he's going to be here. He said, yep, he's going to be here. I can't wait for my people. I bragged on you and bragged on him. And, uh, and, and I, I just can't wait to hear the two of you preach together. So he took us to the motel. And I said, what room is, is, is Dr. So-and-so in? He, said, he told me the room. I went down and knocked on the door. He opened the door. He looked at me and he said, I'm just as surprised as you are. I stuck my hand out and I said, you know, these folks here think we're Christians. And I said, why don't we just shake hands and why don't we decide for three days that we're not going to... I said, by the way, I'm not upset with you about what you wrote about me. Not at all. It's America. You write anything you want to write. I'm not mad at you at all. I said, but why don't we just decide for three days not to say a word about the differences that you have with me? Let's not even say anything about it. And let's just have a good time. He shook my hand. We had prayer. And that's what we did. We had a great time. I told him, I said, now, Wednesday, you going back, write another article against me if you want to. But that's fine. I said, I'm going to be your friend. Now, wait a minute now. That's the way you're supposed to do things. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you what a great Christian I am. Uh, that's the way you're supposed to do things. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I, in my mind, I don't think to myself, dear God, how could he do that? What have I done that's wrong? How could this man turn on me like that? I don't know what in the world I've done. Those thoughts do run through your mind, but let me tell you what you do. You run quickly to God and say, God, this is not right. This is a brother in Christ, and this should not be, and I'm not going to do that. I refuse to pull on that rope. It gives all of my attention. It takes my energy. It takes my strength. I can't help anybody else, and all I'm doing is fighting for myself. I'm not fight for those who need help. Oh, my dear Christian friend, why don't we thank God for the blessing that God has given us? Forget about the things that get us upset. Let it go. Let it go. What good is it going to do anyway? What good are you going to do yourself, your family, anybody else? You're not, you're not going to do it. You go home mumbling. You go home grumbling. And your wife said, what's the matter with you? And you say, brother so-and-so. Now, wait a minute now. Now guess what you've done. Now you've created an enemy when there was no enemy. Your wife thought of that guy as being a nice guy. Now all of a sudden, because she loves you, she's going to hate him. You haven't done any good. Say something in front of your kids. Well, the preacher, I'll tell you what. Shut up. It may be a day and a time when the only one that can reach the heart of your son or your daughter is that man of God that you had for lunch on Sunday. I would suggest you keep your mouth shut, keep it to yourself, and then let it go. Why? Because it does no good to create another enemy. By the way, enemies are only those who we think hurt us. They can be nice to everybody else in the world, but because they mistreat us, they're an enemy. That's not true. We all mistreat people. Sometimes we mean it, sometimes we don't, but we all do. Everybody's hurt somebody at some time or another. Did you know that? You, you holier than thou? You Pharisees walking around here, you're the only ones ever been hurt? You're the only ones ever been mistreated? We've all been mistreated, and we've all mistreated people. And if you sit here this morning and say, I've never mistreated anybody, you're lying to yourself. Because you have mistreated people. So what right does it have for you to strike somebody else off the list? I've seen this morning, let it go! Let it go, let it go, let it go. Man, when I go to, I had a preacher call. He called me and he said uh, on, a, on a Sunday morning, he said to me, you know, I've got, I've got to get this thing right with you before I go to the pulpit. He said, I can't pray without seeing your face. I can't preach without seeing your face. Well, what a horrible thought. And, uh, and he said, I go shave myself in the mirror, I see your face. He said, I've been carrying this thing for 10 years. And he said, this morning I'm going to let it go. 
I had prayer with him and rejoiced with him. Then I began to think about what was it that he was mad at me about. <laughs> so I picked up the rope and I had to call him back. But, but that, that, that's no way to live. There's no way to live. Yeah, there's no way to live. Is it, is it your husband? Is it your wife? Is it a family member? It's not, it's not worth it. Life is too short. It's way too short. You could make your family a heaven on earth if you... Again, I say, how do you know? Listen to your... What do you say? What comes out of your mouth? That tells what's in your heart. So why don't we this morning decide we're just going to let it go. Just drop the rope. And let's enjoy life and enjoy the blessings. What did Mama say? If you can't say something good, don't say nothing at all. That's in Hezekiah chapter 2, verse 1. I'm sorry, that's in Mama chapter 3, verse 1. And Mama was right. Let's bow our heads, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you so much. Let us pray. And now, our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day and this hour. And we have stood for the purpose of preaching. And we pray that it would please You to let us preach. Not for fame nor reputation, but to the end that someone will be saved and strengthened. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, it's good to be back in Lynchburg. I remember the first time I came, I came with such fear and uh, trepidation uh, over the fact that the word was Lynchburg. <laughs> and I had heard much about that word Lynch. And now I come every, every time I get an opportunity and an invitation to come because it's just like coming home. All of the Amen. staff. And to be here with Dr. Falwell, who is one of my brothers indeed. I have a whole lot of brothers, but not indeed. But uh, <laughs> I have uh, a friend in Dr. Falwell. We've been all over the country together. And uh, even when they threw an egg at us, we were together. <laughs> and uh, God bless you and God keep you. God bless you, Doug. He's been singing along with the baseball but, uh, <laughs> and I don't see David. We were up in Sand Mountain in uh, Alabama together. And if you don't think he can rock and roll, you, ought, you should have been up there. <laughs> and so it's good to be back. Good to be back in Virginia and particularly in Lynchburg. On yesterday, <clears throat> I, I normally fly into, uh, what's the? Roanoke. Roanoke's, uh, because they, have a, a little larger plane. <laughs> but when I got to um, when I got to Atlanta, <clears throat> I discovered uh, the sign said Lynchburg, and I discovered that uh, Lynchburg has moved up. They had the same size plane coming into Lynchburg as Rono, so I switched over and flew straight into Lynchburg, and my bags went on to Rono. <laughs> Forgot to transfer them, <laughs> but... Uh...